So good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Um, I must first uh, thank uh, Dr. Anil Garg and the foundation that he pursues so passionately for inviting me to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, themed session here. Um, I'm thankful to the Chairman Advisory Committee, uh, Sri Rajdan Saab, for really guiding the, the overall uh, conference and uh, uh, inviting some of the wonderful speakers there. Um, we have uh, very eminent uh, speakers, very experienced peop people, speakers in the specific areas. So what we are going to do in this session, uh, there are three important things that we are going to talk about. The hydrogen, water. To my mind, water is becoming yet another problematic uh, resource. And uh, third point, waste. How do you manage waste? And uh, what are the issues with that? So these three things, I, what I propose to do is uh, put some thoughts here just to have a little more uh, uh, focused uh, 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 deliberations to set the context uh, in place for these three. So it's just for uh, the hydrogen first. So why hydrogen actually? I think we all know that hydrogen offers us uh, tremendous advantages if you see as high energy efficiency, um, almost nil carbon footprints. Um, when we compare with other uh, sources, there is definitely all around benefits there. It's a renewable source of energy. Uh, very quick, when you really want to use as source, it is uh, very comparable, quicker to refuel. It's, as a fuel cell, it offers a lot of operational advantages like uh, reduced cost, faster, longer running life, also under the very harsh climatic conditions, uh, it works very well, while the other sources may run into difficulty on that. So it stands very, very clearly as a, as a very favorable preferred uh, energy source. When we look at the demand, uh, this is an important thing to see. The Niti Aayog has done a study there. And by 2050, we see that uh, as per the present uh, estimated trends, uh, a demand of about 30 million ton would be there in country. There are already some refineries and other uh, 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 industry uses that uh, hydrogen here. And the, the, the main thing, if you see, which are developing in the uh, newer uh, user areas has been the steel, the automotive, and power. These are the things which would be perhaps driving the hydrogen demand in the next uh, 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 coming years there. Uh, if you see the uh, comparative analysis of the cost, uh, hydrogen can be produced by several uh, uh, processes, namely mainly electrolysis based uh, or from the steam reforming or from coal. Coal perhaps offers a cheaper way of doing it, but there are complications of that. Uh, but what the country is looking about is a green, cleanest form of the hydrogen, where the prices are still higher because it depends upon cleaner energy, which is uh, 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 a critical thing for, for countries so far. But then the, as a way forward, we see if the uh, renewable energy prices come down, as it's shown in the again, in Niti Aayog's uh, uh, study, then maybe by 2040, 2050, that region, the, the green hydrogen can become competitive to other, other uh, 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 methods of, of uh, generation. So if you see the challenges that we face when it comes to generation, there are basically four methods there. So they are competing right now. Some of them form uh, preferably perhaps cheaper processes, but then the emissions control, emissions, uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, is perhaps a deciding factor in terms of uh, uh, challenges there. But then we have high cost, energy intensive uh, processes, dependence on the fuel, uh, 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 fossil fuels, and um, 
if the uh, renewable energy, particularly solar, makes it uh, uh, becomes more cheaper compared to other energy sources, maybe then green hydrogen can perhaps compete very well. So these are the challenges there. When it comes to storage and uh, transportation, uh, there are a number of uh, challenges that uh, the industry is right now uh, facing as far as hydrogen is concerned. Uh, you can use it as a compressed gas, as a cryogenic liquid uh, in the caverns. It can be transported perhaps as a metal-based products or as ammonia. But then we, we, when we compare it for hydrogen, for example, uh, with natural gas, uh, as natural gas, uh, when you transport as liquefied natural gas, and if you want to transport hydrogen as a liquid, then you would require for equal uh, amount of energy almost about three times the bigger ship. So these are the challenges which come on that. When it comes to storage, you require a different metallurgy. Uh, even pipelines, you require different metallurgy. So these are the things, challenges that the industry is right now facing. Also, um, uh, specialized infrastructure is required um, for storage as for transportation. These are the challenges there. When it comes to applications of hydrogen, uh, it, as I said, that the new areas that are emerging is automotive, transport, power, uh, and that could be in aviation, marine, road, and rail, as a feedstock in uh, chemi chemical industry, as a fuel, particularly in those industries which are uh, highly polluting like uh, cement, steel, and power. So where it is finding applications, and therefore it's very important to really promote hydrogen so that we can really capture the benefits of uh, carbon dioxide emissions reduction. So in the applications also, we have limited infrastructure available right now. There are safety concerns. There are no standards as such internationally available to use hydrogen. These are the challenges there. And then um, it has to compete with other alternate fuels which are competitive in price. You know. So these are the challenges I thought would be interesting to do that. One of the projects which I see that is under implementation in UK is transporting hydrogen as ammonia. And once ammonia is transported, it's stored, and then it is selectively uh, again dissociated in a controlled conditions to generate hydrogen. And then there is a distribution system. So this project is under implementation in UK. And I'm sure uh, this, since industry has a lot of experience in dealing with uh, gases like ammonia, uh, which is cryogenic, but then much more, uh, you know, manageable. Uh, this mode of transportation, storage, and usage has great potential to my mind. So these are the challenges I think uh, we'll discuss in this uh, forum here. Coming to water, uh, to my mind, water is actually a very, very critical resource. And we are entering into a phase which is uh, fraught with lot many problems uh, all over that. When it comes to uh, some of the statistics, if you see, uh, fresh water, which is defined as portable water, uh, has 500 parts per million uh, dissolved solids or less than that. Now, that quantity, you should uh, really understand that in the world's overall water availability only 3%, less than 3%, in fact, 2.6% to be precise, 2.6 to 2.7% is the total resource that is available as fresh water. And the, out of that, only 1% is readily available, easily access, accessible on that. So it's, it's a very, very uh, uh, critical resource. We do not really, in our normal use, value that resource. That's important. And I think the deliberations here have been there. And I want to point out that we should pay importance to this resource, which is critical, and perhaps value it. And that's why it's, many things associated with this uh, uh, assume great importance in discussion of this. In, interesting thing is that uh, it's about 3 billion years old. Dinosaurs used to drink the same water as we drink you now. Yeah. Um, coming to India, we have, we all know, 18% of the world's population. We have 4% of the water resource in our country. Not much, actually. 
The problem is actually in water management. Um, India's per capita precipitation um, is about 1170 millimeters um, or 46 inches in a year, which is quite sufficient actually, if you see. But when it comes to per person requirement, it's about 1720 cubic meters of fresh water per person per year. If that is met, then you are not having any problem and this is met through the renewable uh, resource of the water, that is precipitation that, then there is no problem. So there are several studies being done in the country and one of that I pointed out here with IIT Hyderabad here, they have done a, a pan-India survey which has given that many places uh, the water resources are drying up, many places. and. Uh, if you see, uh, if you draw 25% or less of the renewable resource, that is the what comes through rainfall or precipitation, then there's, it is defined as no stress. 25 to 50% becomes low stress. 50, 75, 55 to 75% is medium. So this is the category defined worldwide and accepted definition when it comes to water stress. So when it comes to India, if you see, the per capita water quantity available is decreasing over a period of time. Right from 1951, we have actually come to almost about uh, uh, equal amount here. And that is why it is, it is becoming a, a, an alarm that our requirement of uh, water, fresh water particularly, is going to increase and the availability is getting decreased and decreased. And therefore, we are entering into a water-stressed country. In many places, it's already actually a problem. And therefore, it's very necessary to really give the due value to this critical resource. Uh, when it comes to comparative use, uh, we, we use almost about 85% for farming uh, compared to USA, where it is just about half of that. Uh, industry uses about 22 percent uh, of the water that. Um, so therefore, it's very important that we, we, we uh, become conscious of the water usages. And when it comes to demand, uh, presently we are about 1.4 billion people. The demand as we grow by 2050, the population is expected to be 1.6 billion and the, the per capita requirement would be around 1180. That would mean that uh, we would be a, a water stressed uh, uh, category country, which is going to be a very, very difficult uh, situation. Just to apprise you about how much water, when you eat food, how much water is required to, to generate that. For example, cheese you eat is about 5,605 liters of water for one each kilogram of that. The point here is that most of the non-vegetarian food actually requires much more water when it comes to comparing to vegetables, um, potatoes and all is much minimal. So I think fooding habits have a great uh, this thing impact on the, on the fresh water withdrawals. Also uh, for energy, water and energy are also very much interrelated, they are, they are used, uh, uh, most of the energy processes really use water, fresh water there. So if you see that natural gas, uh, if you see for producing a 2 billion, 2 million BTUs uh, uh, of energy, 33 gallons are required. Uh, and, and when we talk about biofuels, which, are, which is a renewable thing, but then it is a water intensive uh, energy resource, so we should be conscious that that when we really transition and we are trying to transition and produce more biofuels, they are actually uh, water intensive processes there. So your fooding habits, countries' fooding habits have a direct impact on the water resource, availability of water source. Um, also the products that we use, a sheet of paper, 10 liters of water, so when you use Next time a paper, you have to be conscious that 10 liters of water has gone into this. Actually speaking, today you can calculate 
the water for footprints of each person. So there are, of course, virtual water in terms of products, uh, food that you eat, products that you use, plus actual water on that. And I think it would be interesting that if you all calculate your water uh, footprints and make an effort that in some way or the other you can really decrease that or at least optimize, rationalize that. You know. If you see an average person living in US consumes about 2220 gallons of water per day. That is about 44 bathtubs each day. Diet makes a big difference. A vegetarian water footprint can be less as much as 50% of the non-vegetarian. There are significant differences there. We should be conscious of that, all these impacts here. And this is a way you can calculate your uh, water footprint. It would be interesting to do that. The point I want to drive here is that water is a critical resource. We should value it. We should maybe price it so that it attains a, a, an appropriate uh, this thing uh, value. And what all you can do in 50 liters a day, there are uh, suggestions that you can really uh, easily uh, 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 you know, maintain your daily routine by consuming just limited water. Of course, there are opportunities and, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, barriers uh, when it comes to water, this thing. So there are many things that happen. I just want to point out, for example, here, uh, simple thing, uh, a study has been done that le leakages, leaky pipes uh, cost about 3.7 trillion liters of water annually. Uh, your, your tanks full and, and actually uh, uh, all the water uh, going down the drain is a common thing. Just imagine how much. Leakage itself is 3.7 trillion liters, too much. So I think we should be conscious that this is, once it is priced, maybe uh, we'll become more conscious of that. Uh, so there is a strong case that we relook at the policies uh, uh, on water usage. Coming to solid waste management, this is the third aspect of today's uh, session here. I think it's very important here. I just want to flag certain issues. Uh, you know, uh, waste management really, if you don't do properly, it create unsanitary conditions, pollution of environment, health hazards, all, all kinds of problem. So a process of collecting, treating, reusing, or disposing of is the waste management here. How much waste is uh, generated? US uh, averages two kgs per day. Um, Canada is even higher. Japan is better there. Developing countries, 0.5 kgs per day per person. India is higher than that, 0.67. And this is a last year's data. So this is only growing here. And this, uh, we need to really see the electronic waste is becoming more and more problematic here. So we should also be conscious of how much waste we are creating. And then we, we need to really work out that we are able to reuse and recirculate this thing. Technologically and scientifically dealing with wastage, waste management only started much later actually in this. And therefore, the, the focus came on using this waste for energy recovery. And it is the studies have pointed out that as much as uh, one third of the energy uh, generated by coal can be extracted out of the waste generation, which is great. You know or it can be used for composting or landfill or recycling. But a important point is that when we have a project to implement, pre-incident planning for waste management must be made as a part of the project. This is a very, very strong requirement. Not that we react to that, that these are the byproducts and we don't know what to do that. So when it comes to project implementation, each project must have pre-project uh, analysis of what waste will be created and how it will be dealt with in terms of useful disposal on that. Um, lastly, I think there are the five R's very nicely mentioned here uh, in terms of waste management. Uh, the refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose and recycle. I think these three areas are very critical for India. Uh, when it comes to hydrogen, it has a potential to really uh, transform the energy scenario, energy market of the country. Uh, when it comes to water, 
I think we're becoming a water stress company uh, a country, and therefore it's very important to really give due importance to that. And third, I think waste should be realized as a resource today, and we have a great potential of generating useful materials, recycle it, and, and also energy. I myself had the opportunity to visit one small country where I saw 23 operating plants of 1 megawatt to 20 megawatt based on waste. And when you visit these plants, you are visiting a normal uh, power plant. The area environment nearby is so clean, you cannot m really uh, you know, feel that this is a waste uh, processing plant. So I think if the technology is available, why can't India do it? So I'm sure our speakers here uh, would be uh, making their points. I just wanted to put that these are the issues that are there with these three aspects there. Um, since Mr. Negi has not yet come, I would invite uh, Mr. Vivek Bandopadhyay first to make his interventions and presentation here. Mr. Bandopadhyay, please come. Thank you. you have the choice here or there, whatever. Yeah.